I'm never going to talk about these things again. And it, I always do. And it's very depressing. So I thought this afternoon we'd start with a game. Let me take a moment or two, but a game you may have all played. It's a, <coughs> a game I play with a lot of my old friends, and it's called, called True or False. It's an old part of the game. And um, as someone who has wasted too much of his time accumulating a bizarre collection of dubious sounding factual information, with a useful facility for spinning a yarn, it's a game I play very often. And so, and it's always played with ten examples, they're all very short, and you have to guess whether they're true or false. But I don't want any no's from the audience, like you, Comrade Thomas, calling out the answers. Okay, here we go. Ready? Right. The strawberry milkshakes, getting open now, the strawberry milkshakes sold at most fast food takeaways contain 63 chemicals blended in a laboratory and no fruit of any kind, let alone perish before the strawberry. The fur of a polar bear is not at all white. The US Mint, by mistake, once stamped a batch of gold coins, which instead of, in God we trust, bore the infinitely more accurate legend, in gold we trust. <laughs> <laughs> Every year, in the UK, on average, there are 7,500 notifiable accidents with supermarket trolls. In Canada, tree trunks are cut into logs by water. The gong struck introducing rank organization movies is made of carbon. With seahorses, it is the male who gets pregnant. It is against the law to call a member of parliament a daffy down dilly. But funnily enough, that's not the word I usually think of when I think of members of parliament. At a bar in London, they dispense a champagne and brandy cocktail costing 160 pounds. Last one, a museum in Wakefield is entirely devoted to rhubarb. <laughs> <laughs> the trick I have when I play this game, but don't tell my friends, is to honestly state quite accurately that they are all true. But for some reason that I can't comprehend, my friends believe I'm tricking them, so they never get it right. Anyway, researching the familiar ground of the Labour Party and the atomic bomb, I surprisingly discovered a corking true or false declaration. A Labour Party defence spokesman once told the truth when answering a probing question. <laughs> well, I know that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Maybe I'll reveal it, maybe I won't. It is indeed a sad irony that one of the most remarkable scientific invention, revelations of all time, Ernest Rutherford's declaration in 1911, the, that the atom, the smallest unit of matter, 10 million of which could be placed single file on a pinhead. It was not solid, he said, but contained a core, a nucleus, that itself was orbited by swarms of electrons, a most astonishing outside and um, insight. And it is indeed a sad irony that it should result in the deadly harvest of nuclear weapons we see today. And a sadder, sadder irony still that the so called Workers' Party, the Labour Party, the party pledged the abolition of war and want should have played such a devious and unprincipled part in the reaping of that harvest. Alas, the Labour Party's record on defence has been illogical, often incoherent, and invariably surreptitious and fraudulent. Being swept into power by a massive majority in 1945, just 11 days prior to the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. Hardly all good well. 
But Clement Attlee was quick to sound the bell of hope. In the House of Commons, on November the 22nd that year, he stated, No one of these weapons has any legitimate place in the armaments which are necessary for ordinary purposes of internal security or the protection of a government against lawlessness. They are weapons of total war designed for the mass destruction and we must banish total war from the world if civilization is to continue. That's Hansard, 1945, column 600. Fine words indeed. A little more than a year later, on January the 8th, 1947, a secret subcommittee, Gen 163, comprising of five senior ministers, deliberately chosen as not opposing the development of the atomic bomb, under the chairmanship of the man of fine words, Clement Attlee, approved plans for a British atomic bomb. Neither the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Hugh Dalton, or the President of the Board of Trade, Stafford Cripps, both of whom opposed building the bomb on economic grounds, <coughs> were invited onto this committee. And even some ministers who were present got the distinct feeling that somehow this decision had been made already without their knowledge. And they were right. For an even more secret subcommittee, Gen 75 began meeting in August 1945, three months before Atlas' fine words. It was not in the least concerned with banishing total war. In fact, its chairman always referred to it as, the chairman was Atli, of course, the Atom Bomb Committee. Yes, three months before that bell ringing speech. And on December the 1st, 1945, a mere nine days after those fine words, a decision was made to build the first atomic power. One minister, who was an influential presence on both committees, was the rather belligerent Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevin. The minutes of Gen 75, the 26th of October 1946, record his contribution thus. <clears throat> Our prestige in the world, as well as our chances of securing American cooperation, would both suffer if we would not exploit to the full a discovery in which we played a leading part at the outset. But what he actually said, according to others present, was, we've got to have this thing over here, whatever it costs, and we've got to have the bloody Union Jack on top of it. That was all that time before the finals. This committee met, and nine days after, that decision was made. <clears throat> this momentous decision was never debated in Parliament, or even in Cabinet, and was only revealed to the House by means of a planted question on the 12th of May, 1948. 1948. The reply to the question was short, but definitely not sweet. All types of weapons, including atomic weapons, are being developed. That's in Hansard as well. No more information was given, even then. No follow-up questions were allowed. Good old Labour Party democracy. And a D-notice was put on even that pathetic answer. By the time Churchill came to power in October 1951, Plants had been built already at Springfields, Capenhurst, Windscale, and Aldermaster. <clears throat> and technical support establishments set up at Harwell and Risley. An expenditure of over £100 million successfully concealed from the House of Commons. The party of the people had spoken. Or rather, it hadn't spoken. And the new Prime Minister... Winston Churchill continued the good work. The first British atomic device 
which when I was writing this, notice the acronym for which was BAD, was tested at Montebello Islands, 50 miles off the coast of Australia, on the 3rd of October 1952. And on the 24th of October, and this is from Hansard again, Churchill acknowledged his gratitude to the Labour Party with these words. All those concerned in the production of the first British atomic bomb are to be warmly congratulated on the successful outcome of an historic episode. And I should no doubt pay my compliments to the leader of the opposition of the party opposite for initiating it. And on hearing this praise from Churchill, Attlee, of whom Churchill had once scathingly remarked, an empty taxi pulled up and Clement Attlee got out, bowed and smiled his thanks from the labour benches. But there's more to the story than those facts. If I was just here to knock old Attlee, that would be pies. But in fairness, the wheels of the atomic development in the UK were already turning some time before Attlee came to power. And we must remember, it's hard not to, uh, to remember, it's hard to remember sometimes, but British scientists led the world in nuclear technology in 1940. It was a pair of British scientists uh, who initially demonstrated, contrary to what Einstein believed, that an atomic bomb could be made small enough to be dropped on the airplane. Guess what? A high-powered secret committee were set up and held their first meeting on April the 10th, 1940, in Burlington House, headquarters of the Royal Society. One of the members of that committee, a man who was to play a very important role, was called John Cockcroft. He had been a protege of Ernest Rutherford at the Cavendish Laboratories in Cambridge. <clears throat> Two months after the committee was formed, its chairman, chose a new name for it in order to disguise its activities they loved with this. And it was called the Maud Committee. And writing this, I noticed that was an anagram of you mad. <laughs> it all seems very ironic, doesn't it? There's a nice little story behind the choice <coughs> of that name. A few telling this story actually get it entirely correct, but this is the correct version, I assure you. Maud Ray was a governess who had once taught the children of the great Danish physicist Niels Bohr, and she lived in Kent. Another physicist, Lisa Meitner, once sent a perfectly innocent cable to a friend which read as follows, met Niels and Margaret recently, both well but unhappy about recent events. Please inform John Cockroft and Maud Ray, Kent. When it was passed on to Cockroft, because of the paranoia and panic of the time, and in view of what he had heard about the German interest in atomic matters, he jumbled it around and decided that Maud Ray, Kent, was an anagram for radium taken. <laughs> and he immediately sent this letter telling another physicist, James Chadwick, all about this terrible news. And so the committee's name was actually this, in joke, they called it more. They loved all that when they were planning to blow up the world. <clears throat> anyway, the purpose of the Maud Committee was to ascertain how quickly a bomb could be made, and it concluded that a uranium bomb could indeed be made by the end of the war. Work on the route to producing a uranium bomb began in Britain, another secret uh, project, I'm afraid, codenamed Tube Alloys. Later, for reasons of safety, was taken to the Manhattan Project in America and incorporated there. It was agreed to proceed on the basis, very important this, of shared knowledge and joint development, a partnership. In fact, it was called Tube Alloys Joint Venture. Tube Alloys being the code for the atomic bomb. In 1944, John Cockroft 
took over the running of the Cavendish Laboratory, which had been moved to Montreal. There, his team carried on research adjunct to the tube alloys program in the Manhattan Project. The research he headed in Canada anticipated the Labour government's decision to build an atomic bomb. And the man in charge of that research, a man called John Anderson, directed all of it, told his staff in January uh, exactly that. He said it had probably been already decided before the team even left Canada. The bomb was going to be built. And incidentally, the Soviet Union, this is also important as we'll see later, had at least 20 agents working in the Canadian project, including the most significant, the physicist Alan May Nunn, who was recruited by none other than Donald McLean, who also worked over there. One of the things that Attlee became acquainted with after becoming Prime Minister was, yes, another secret committee, of which he was ignorant, a secret agreement, uh, and not public re publicly revealed this one until 12 years later. And it was called the Quebec Agreement. <clears throat> and it took place between Churchill and Roosevelt. <laughs> Again, uh, in many books and pamphlets, a popular misconception of this is uh, given. It's said that it didn't take part in place in Quebec at all, but in Washington, and it was given that name as another joke just because it was scribbled on a piece of paper headed the Citadel Quebec. That is untrue. In fact, there were two Quebec meetings. The first, on the 1st of August 1943, which this first most important <coughs> agreement was made, was in Quebec, and the second was in Washington. The first was the most important, and it had three main clauses. Well, what they thought were main clauses, they weren't really. British thought were important. First, they agreed never to use this agency, the projected atomic bomb, against each other. Second, they agreed not to use it against third parties without each other's consent. Third, they agreed that neither of them uh, would communicate any information about the tube alloys program to any third parties except by mutual consent. What that meant, in plain language, point one, not using it against each other. If it came to the crunch, uh, the United States could certainly employ it against the United Kingdom. <coughs> but alas, the United Kingdom were not able then, nor are they now, nor are, have they ever been able to launch an attack with atomic weapons upon the United States. So it was completely meaningless. Point two, mutual consent before use. Yes, that really is true. The US really did seek British consent, not generally acknowledged, before they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and then on Nagasaki. They actually had to have under this agreement, the signature of the British government representatives. And it was readily granted. The representatives on the Tube Alloy Combined Policy Committee on July the 4th, 1945, uh, signed uh, the OK for the dropping of those bombs. Appropriately enough, of course, that was American Independence Day. Point three, only telling others by agreement. That meant, of course, it was agreed not to tell Stalin. But it didn't matter because he knew anyway because of the 20 spies that were over there. What really troubled him, however, really troubled him when he discovered this on coming to office, and you'll like this, was clause four. <laughs> And Clause 4 was the only one that really mattered to the United States, this other rubbish. Clause 4 said 
that the commercial and industrial uses of the nuclear program should be limited in such a manner as the president, the president, might consider fair and equitable in view of the large additional expense incurred by the United States. That was the clause really mattered. So there we have it. For shared knowledge and joint development, joint development, two alloys, read the controlled by the United States. Any future commercial benefits shall be controlled by the United States government. That's what he said, and that's what happened. That was not regarded as a wartime convention, which incidentally, the signature on the one about needing consent to drop bombs was regarded as a wartime convention, and they soon got rid of that in Congress. This was, of course, not regarded as a wartime convention. So there we are. Now back, after that little bit of history, which I hope not all of you knew, we're back in 1945, the war is over, and the People's Party is now in power. But, lend lease is ended, desperate economic problems exist throughout Europe. Cities are in ruins, tens of millions are dead, and who dominates? The world stage. Who holds the winning hand? Hugh Dalton, the Labour Chancellor, put it very well. The Americans have half the total income of the world. Half the total income of the world. But won't either spend it in buying other people's goods, or lending it, or giving it away. Very nice position to be in. Then, on top of all that, the good old shared knowledge, true alloys, joint development agreement took another blow. In 1946, legislation was introduced entitled the Atomic Energy Act in the United States, commonly called the McMahon Act, after its instigator, Brian McMahon. Senator Brian McMahon, a man worthy of the talk, all on his own. Actually, I only need to tell you one thing about him to make you understand what I mean. He said in the Senate in January 1946, the atomic bomb is the greatest, greatest event since the birth of Christ. And he went on to help Teller and all the others develop the United States monopoly of that bomb by supporting and passing and bludgeoning act after act. He died in 1951 from cancer, but he'd already achieved a lot. So, the McMahon Act stipulated that atomic information should no longer be shared with the United Kingdom. All that cooperation, down appropriately enough, the tubes. In withdrawing cooperation, and exchange in complete contradiction of that second Quebec Agreement. This one, uh, you don't know about this yet, but you'll soon hear about it. This one was written uh, on an aid memoir, or resulted in an aid memoir, composed by Churchill, but accepted by Roosevelt, that stated in paragraph two, full collaboration between the United States and the British government in developing the tube alloys for military and commercial purposes should continue after the defeat of Japan and less than <coughs> terminated by joint agreement. But of course, as we know, the United States don't like anything as they're now doing with the Missile Defence Act, the um, Strategic um, and Missile Defence Act uh, um, agreement, a rough, rough shot over anything they don't want to do. The reason for this act, the reason given for it, was that there were too many British spies in, in the projects, and they were likely uh, to leak the information to the Russians. Well, of course, that was true, but of course, that wasn't the real reason. Anyway, the act demonstrated the extent of the dominance of the United States over the British government in nuclear matters from that moment, and it was a pattern that has never been broken. 
It was not until 1954 that any amendment was made to the Maman, Maman Act, and a new agreement for cooperation, ha ha, was established on the 15th of June 1955. I'm not going to go into that murky agreement, sufficient to say it involved the rather dubious exchange and unfair exchange of uranium and, uranium and plutonium. A further agreement was signed in three years later, but it's all meaningless. As for the leaking of secrets by the 20 uh, or so spies, the most insightful comment ever made about this matter was by the American satirist Walt Saul, uh, when the Pentagon during the 60s was claiming that Russian technology was miles ahead, miles in advance. There was a missile gap, we'll never catch up. And Walt Saul acidly observed, if they are so far ahead, why don't we just give them all our goddamn secrets and put them ten years behind? <laughs> The jingoistic remarks by Ernest Bevin that I mentioned earlier about the Union Jack were clearly reflecting the anger that the Labour Party felt over what they saw as a betrayal in the enacting of the Pagan Act. Well shown the buggers, if they don't want to help us, we'll make it by ourselves. Well now, what do you think? Was it a splendid triumph? British bulldog defiance and ingenuity? Or was it what the American government wanted all along? A European nuclear power under United States control, but with the British government shouldering the expense, whilst becoming a loyal customer, purchasing highly costly and largely useless nuclear weapons for the foreseeable future. Did you know, for instance, and this is just one of hundreds of examples I could give, that the concession granted allowing Polaris submarines to be based in Holy Lock was part of a deal entitling the Tory government to purchase, at considerable expense, a missile that was never made. Yes, the Skyball. Here it is in here, don't believe me, defence white paper, in which it says, instantly, their own special language, Skybolt is coming, subject to successful completion of the project. That way of saying it's never coming. Worse still, it was necessary to make another useless deal in order to get a little bit of that money we'd already paid for the weapon that didn't arrive back. And rights granted in return for something mentioned earlier, martial aid, and for having Polaris under Atlee, Wilson and Callaghan afforded the US military tenancy of parts of the UK virtually in perpetuity, made us the unsinkable aircraft carrier. Now, I don't want to be put on the charge for what I'm saying next, but of all the Labour leaders since 1945, I'll stop there for a minute and just remind you about them, because each one successfully was more devious than their predecessors over nuclear weapons. Gainskill, with his cunning and willful lies about the unilateralist position of the 1960 conference, and his anti-democratic cheating at the 1961 conference, allowing unions to vote both ways. Wilson, going against his firm 1964 pre-election pledge, to convert Polaris into non-nuclear weapons or else cancel the program altogether and then the following year ordering four of them the renown, the repulse, I love these names the revenge and the revolution and when Polaris became obsolescent in 1966 it was Wilson who immediately replaced it with Poseidon also famously remembered, of course, uh, as an incident in 1964, and I don't think there's ever been any other incident like it, when he expelled Michael Foote from the party for voting against the Tory defence estimates. I don't think that's ever been done in politics. And then, of course, there's Callaghan 
Uncle Jim, conceding from Parliament the biggest ever undeclared expenditure in the Chevalier programme to update Polaris, a sum of one billion pounds not revealed until Francis Pym came to power and revealed it in 1980. And this is where the defence spokesman told the truth. Ready for it? Asked if they were intending to spend four to six hundred million pounds on the update of Polaris, he quite correctly said no, because of course it was a billion pounds. <laughs> It's the best I could come up with. <laughs> and this, <clears throat> all of these things, there's more and more in each, each one of these leaders' regimes. More and more and more. It goes on and on and on. And by the way, for those of you who need to know, a Chevaline is a French mountain goat capable of death-defying flying leaps. But, finally about Callahan, believe it or not, it was not Mrs. Thatcher who organised Trident. The first meetings about Trident were when good old Uncle Jim approached in secret President Carter and virtually arranged for that missile to come at the Guadalupe summit. Now, I always try to be fair. I've tried to be fair to Atlee. As I say, of all the, of all the prime ministers uh, uh, ever, of all of these ministers ever, uh, of all of the people I've been described, well, I've described a couple more first before I say that. I want to see this book. I don't recommend it unless you want to fall asleep. It's the autobiography of James Callaghan. And I thought, to be fair, I'd just look up what he had to say about the Chevalier incident. Well, not to be fair. Uh, Chevalier. Not in there. <laughs> Would you believe it? It's not in there. This great big fat book and Chevaline is not mentioned once. And then dear old Michael Foote, well he wasn't the leader for long, but how can we ever forget his cringe making support for the Falklands War? How can we ever forget that? Or forgive him? And lastly, my pet hate, the odious hypocrite, Kinnock. This is, Kinnock, listen to this. Going for a parliamentary nomination in 1969, he remarked to one of his supporters, Terry Burns, I'll be glad when it's all over and I could put my CND badge back on. Do you remember all the phony promises he made when he was leader of the Labour Party? How many of you remember his shadow minister of defence, Martin O'Neill? How many would recognise him if he passed you in the street today? This is what their astonishing document said. <coughs> One, the elimination of all American bases. Two, a non-nuclear defence policy. Three, a non-nuclear Europe. Four, a reduction in private arms sales. This from the party who'd, who'd introduced the first political super arms salesman in Dennis Haley. No participation in Star Wars, and best of all, are you ready for this? Best of all, our aim is the complete global nuclear disarmament by the year 2000. Oh, come on, and all this from a man who was scared to wear his CND badge for a nomination interview. Damn it, I wore mine when I was interviewed to join the party, and I still got in. <laughs> <laughs> Please forgive me, but what a load of old books. Honestly. Anyway, as I was saying before I interrupted myself two or three times, of all the Labour leaders, Atley might just be the one, because he was so stitched up, for whom, if I was in an exceptionally benign mood and very drunk, I might, in spite of what we've heard, feel a subatomic twinge of sympathy. If only it never said anything. Here are some, I'm going to end now, 
Here are some more words from Appy. 1955. The fact that we do possess these weapons does have an effect. It is quite an illusion to think that it does not have an effect. 1964. After a most refreshing change of heart. If a man had any personality, he could put across British foreign policy without a nuclear bomb in his hand. As some of you may know, a couple of weeks ago the BBC paid homage to Beethoven by playing every piece of music he ever wrote in a week. Bad luck if you missed it. A shame if you've never listened to Beethoven. Not only a great composer, but a truly remarkable man. Someone who is really worth talking about, and I wish I could spend time talking about him. And he too was betrayed by politics. Thank goodness it wasn't actually weak, where every one of his speeches was fed to us every day for a week, all day. Well, I think we've had enough of Attlee and the rest of all of his friends, the People's Party with their fine weasel words, their forked tongues that betrayed every hope decent human beings had to live in a peaceful world. So instead, I shall finish with some splendid words written about my great hero Beethoven. And some of you may have heard me use them before, and you'll be glad that I'm telling you them again. Listen to these words. Masterpieces of art are instilled with a surplus, renewable energy. An energy that provides a motive force for the change in relations between human beings. Because they contain projections of human desires and goals which have not yet been achieved. Beethoven's last piano sonata is a monument to his conviction that solutions to the problems facing humanity lie ever within our grasp if they can be recognized for what they are. Good old Beethoven, we couldn't have put that better ourselves.